I beg you to try it, Patricio. Let me get this straight, Carla. You disagree on the weapon, you disagree on the number of blows. <laughs> Listen to me, Patricio. You dare once in your life. Hey, people, Trish Wood here, and this is Trish Wood is Critical. A lot going on in the world right now, don't you think? Especially watching what is happening in China. The massive and beautiful protests against the COVID zero lockdowns that uh, included nailing people into their apartments in a building that later caught fire and burned a number of people alive uh, because they couldn't escape. So the Chinese people seem to be wide awake now. And it's this is a very, very interesting moment in history for us all, because China, which is now out of control in its moves to get to COVID zero, which was never, ever, ever a rational approach to COVID-19. It wasn't. It didn't work anywhere. Australia tried it. We had our covid public health people in Canada trying it. It doesn't work. You can't do it. Viruses don't operate that way. Not only that, even if it did work, it is in humane and authoritarian. And there is a point where we draw the line. Nevertheless, never forget that the two and a half years of hell that we lived through around lockdowns and school closures were modeled for us by China and Wuhan, where the virus first came from. That is who the World Health Organization and Tony Fauci and Dr. Tam and the rest of them around the world were getting their marching orders and taking their scientific advice from was lockdowns. And what we're seeing in China right now is what happens when that is taken to its fiercest extreme. China is not a country we should be taking health advice from. And we should be ashamed now that we ever did that. And what we are seeing in the streets there, the the, the COVID camps they've set up, separating children from their parents, allowing people to burn to death in an apartment building, that is where these policies lead. And many of us knew that from the beginning and said so. And we were shouted down, including by our own prime minister, as being anti-science. So we're going to talk a little bit about China today. And after we do that, we are going to talk to one of my favorite people, Viva Fry, who uh, he was our eyes and ears during the Freedom Convoy, wasn't he? He was doing those wonderful live streams, and uh, that is really reporting for democracy because the live streams were unfiltered. He just walked around interviewing people live and letting us know what was actually happening down at the convoy. Those of us who I went to the one in Toronto, but I couldn't I couldn't get to the one down in in Ottawa for a bunch of reasons. But but Viva was our eyes and ears, and we had him on coffee with the convoy a couple of times. And now we've got him back. He's moved to Florida, and he's involved in a couple of ventures down there. And we talk about all of it. We talk about the, the COVID zero policies in China. We talk about the Emergencies Act hearings, which were very, very disheartening, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So do stick around for Viva. It's a really interesting and at times disheartening and at times fun interview with a person that I greatly, greatly admire. Um, But before we do that, let's just do our little pitch so we can get into some the meat of some of the reporting on China, just so you know what's happening there. Um, We are funded by our listeners like you, and you can do so by going to my website, which is trishwoodpodcast.com. You can support us through Patreon, PayPal, and Substack, where I'm doing some writing as well. We prefer Substack because they're a free speech platform, and that's what we believe in. We believe in free speech, and it was lack of free speech hampered by big tech and legacy media that got us into this jackpot around COVID policies and the collateral damage that followed. So so do support us. We'd be very, very grateful. It helps to keep the lights on around here. And I do have people I pay who work for me. So please think of contributing to us. We'd be very, very grateful. 
We also have a merch store now, which you can find at trishwoodpodcast.com. There's lots of good stuff in there for Christmas gifts and stocking stuffers. Um, our popular no hat is back and obviously still needed because they want us masking up again. So that could be fun for some of your enlightened family members, or maybe give it to the people who aren't so enlightened and see what they say when they pull it out of their Christmas stocking. No, we like that word. There's also some hats that support women who feel threatened by trans extremism, which is to say most women who are awake. Adult human female is their hashtag. That's a good one. And um, we also have some of the prime minister's phraseology he used attacking the protesters, the convoy and the rest of us who supported them as um, people holding unacceptable views. We have a, a hat for that, too. So let's not ever forget he's trying to deny that he said those things and we're not going to let him. So um, go to our merch store at trishwoodpodcast.com and see if there's something there that might appeal to someone on your Christmas gift list. The other thing we're doing this year, it's a new feature um, that will be available on my website is we're going to start doing some video greetings. You can purchase a video greeting from me for someone you love who loves our show. And I really am excited about this. I really want to do them. And if you enter certain information about what you'd like me to say, as long as it's nice, <laughs> I'm not going to attack your relatives that you don't like. But if you want us to do a video greeting and say some nice things like happy birthday or maybe engage a little bit on some of the, the topics that your loved one likes that we do on the show, I would love, love, love to do that. So you can purchase that too. And that money goes towards keeping the show going. So try that. I did one. Uh, for a young woman that I met at Bedeck, Nova Scotia, she's mentored by an 82-year-old lawyer whose birthday it was and who's been a longtime listener of the show and a fan of mine for decades, right, through thick and thin. So that's really meaningful. Uh, and so I did one for her as a gift for him, and that was uh, really fun to do. I introduced him to my rescue dog, Chili, as well. So it was good. It was a good day recording that. So do think about that. Um, one of the things we're going to be talking a lot about today with Viva Fry and also in the commentary is just the, the sorry, sorry state of legacy media journalism. It's just, it's awful. And I think that at no time during COVID and the post COVID time we're living in now, has it been more apparent than now and the reason that I say that is because now legacy media is starting to be a little bit critical of China for its lockdown policies after spending two years cheering them on here. It's disgusting. Um, I mean, you could say, well, China is doing it more extremely. But you know what? That's where we were headed. And also, never forget, never forget that there was extraordinary amounts of collateral damage here and in America, and in Australia, and in the UK, from lockdown policy, suicides, drug overdoses, ruined businesses, ruined lives, ruined marriages, ruined relationships, not to mention the fact we've all got PTSD from it, right? So yeah, the I suppose the, the Chinese approach right now is more acute in the moment. But we, our lockdowns caused just as much damage, if not more, because they went on for two and a half years, well, not two and a half years, but two years anyway. So the legacy media cheered those on and anybody who spoke out against them was considered fringe, to quote our prime minister, or a conspiracy theorist or anti-science, even though there's no science to prove that lockdowns actually did what they wanted them to to do. There's good evidence that the curve was flattening every single time by the time they brought lockdowns back and that they were flattening as a natural response to the way viruses move through a human population, right? But none of the people involved in public health have been particularly honest about that. And the media is mainly responsible. Um, I want to just read a little bit from a guy who I, I talk about a lot, Eugippius, who wrote a piece really chastising 
uh, the New York Times for their hypocrisy. The New York Times at the beginning of COVID was really, really pushing harsh, harsh lockdowns, right? They were leading the pack. Um, and this is what they they say. Um, when there were anti-lockdown protests in North America, they didn't want to talk about them. They were, according to the New York Times, the they were birthed by shadowy political actors with ties to Trump for anti-lockdown protests in 2020. So the, remember that they did that, right? First of all, they didn't show, they, they never publicized the anti-lockdown protests in North America and around the world. They didn't. Legacy media avoided that like the plague. And I know they did because I was either attending them myself or following them on Twitter and these feeds would come in of tens of thousands of people in the streets in Amsterdam and London and Australia and the legacy media wouldn't touch those stories. But, oh, people protest in China and now they want to start talking about it? Like, you can't make this stuff up. You can't make it up, right? It's just so very, very frustrating for me as a former legacy media journalist. Here's what the New York Times said. Outside China, the rest of the world has adapted to the virus and is near normalcy. Take soccer's premier event, the World Cup. Thousands of people from across the globe have assembled in Qatar and are cheering on their teams shoulder to shoulder without masks in packed stadiums. China's approach won praise during the beginning of the pandemic, and there is no doubt it has saved lives. Really? Okay. But now that approach looks increasingly outdated. What is that? Like, what? how is that a scientific analysis? Is that, Are we talking about like a fashion crime here? That approach is increasingly outdated. Almost three years after the coronavirus emerged, the contrast between China and the rest of the world couldn't be starker. So that's the New York Times. Here is what Eugippius says. He says, emphasis mine, talking about the increasingly outdated line. Emphasis mine, because it's probably the most amazing line in the whole piece. Here we have America's foremost propaganda outlet trying desperately to accuse China of unjust dictatorial repression for the crime of implementing in a more organized and coherent way the very same zero COVID policies that Times journalists spent nearly two years supporting. What's actually wrong with the harsh Chinese lockdowns? Well, says the Times, who can't say anything else, they've become unfashionable. Times journalists who have also suddenly discovered that lockdowns are bad for the economy. China's economy has been hurt by the restrictions, in quotes from the Times, which have, in quotes, hammered business both large and small. Major companies are seeking to escape the effects of closures by expanding production outside China, all the while reduced foot traffic hurts businesses in the main streets of towns and cities. That's the New York Times. That's horrible when it happens in China, says Eugipius, but in Germany or Canada, it's totally worth it. I mean, right? What absolute hypocrisy. They cannot run from their own perfidy in the way that they have behaved in the last three years. It is terrible, and we do not accept it. I do have for you a little bit of tape from China, and this is some of the sounds outside the apartment building on Urumqi Road, I believe it's pronounced. Do forgive me if you speak Mandarin and I'm screwing it up. Um, in the French concession, uh, where the apartment building caught on fire, multiple people died because they were locked into, some of them were locked into their apartment, I believe at least 10 people. And this is what it sounded like outside that building. <laughs> So that was sound taken by, I actually don't know who recorded that, but it was taken by somebody outside the apartment building that was on fire with people inside burning to death because they'd been welded in due to China's COVID zero policy. 
policy that media are now starting to criticize after they cheered it on here, or at least a version of it here. Um, So it is time to really take stock of legacy media's performance all throughout COVID and and even now. Um, And something along those lines took place in Toronto a couple of nights ago during the Monk debates. Um, I want to play you a clip of uh, Douglas Murray, who was arguing against legacy media at the Monk debates. And he absolutely skewers mainstream media in Canada. It is embarrassing. He reads some examples, probably ones I've actually talked about on this show with you before, but hearing him go after the legacy media in Canada the way he does here is absolutely heartbreaking. Listen to this. Your prime minister decided in advance that these people were, oh, what did he do? All the modern uh, excommunications. They were Nazis. They were white supremacists. They were anti-Semites. They were probably homophobes. They were misogynists. They were probably transphobes, etc., etc., etc. He did all the things you do in the modern political age if you want to just defenestrate somebody who's awkward to you. And then he brings in the Emergency Powers Act. Now, at such a time, what would the mainstream media do? It would question it. It would question it. The Canadian mainstream media did not. The Canadian mainstream media acted as an amen chorus of the Canadian government. I will give you a couple of examples. But, (laughs) ladies and gentlemen, I could go on for hours with examples of this. You had a CBC host describing the Freedom Convoy as a, quote, feral mob. You had a Toronto Star columnist saying, quote, sorry for the language, It's a homegrown hate farm that was then jet-fueled by an American right-funded rat-fucking operation. Jesus, they can't even write at these papers anymore. (laughs) CBC said that two indigenous women were so scared to go outside in Ottawa because of racist violence didn't bother to mention that indigenous drummers had led the truckers in an O Canada rendition. The National Observer said that the many black and indigenous Freedom Convoy supporters were in fact duped by the truckers. The Globe and Mail reporter said, my 13-year-old son told me to tell protesters I'm not a Jew out of fear of anti-Semitic violence without mentioning that one of the leaders of the convoy was himself Jewish. Now, why is this so rancid? Utterly, utterly rancid and corrupt. Because in this country, your media, your mainstream media, is funded by the government. A totally corrupted system. In 2018, oh, election year, coincidence, the Canadian media has given $595 million over five years. The Toronto Star estimated it was going to be getting $3 million from the government in the first half of the year. It went on and on. So you see, the mainstream, the government in Canada can tell people to, to, they can tell the banks to shut down people's bank accounts. Oh, yeah. Your government can do that, and if you're happy with that, just think about what would happen if the shoe was on the other foot. The government can do that, but in Canada, they can also tell the media what to do, and the media does the bidding of the the Canadian government. That isn't a free society's media. I've seen unfree countries all my life, but this, in a developed, liberal democracy like Canada, is a disgrace. We're not saying don't read the mainstream media. We're just saying don't trust them. So that is a British journalist and commentator, Douglas Murray, talking about our shameful, shameful legacy media here in Canada. And I think he absolutely nailed it. He didn't say anything I haven't been saying on the show for a very long time. Um, It's pretty awful to hear it from, you know, a Brit, but he's he's absolutely right about it. Um, we, We don't have a democracy. We don't have one. If legacy media is either only siding with our liberal government or seeing everything through a lefty woke lens, which they're also doing. It's uh, we're adrift. We are at sea. And one of the pillars of our democracy has crumbled and we got to figure out what we're going to do about it. So, and no, no, nowhere has that been more highlighted and exposed than in the coverage of the convoy and in the coverage of our prime minister, who in my view lied under oath during the Emergencies Act hearings. So let's get now to uh, Viva Fry, who, as I say, was our eyes and ears during the convoy. Um, he's moved down to Florida. He's got a new project going. And, um, yeah, this is this was a really fun interview for me. So here's my conversation with Viva Fry, also known as David Freitheit. 
Hi, David. How are you? Good and yourself? I'm very well. Thank you. So you are down in Florida now. You were in Montreal when we were when we were speaking during the um the those the heyday of the convoy. Um, oh, yeah. What are you doing in Florida? So, well, I, I've uh, got a, an agreement. I, I'm working with Rumble, which is the the video hosting platform like YouTube. Yeah. So we 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 entered into a contract which actually facilitated uh, a visa, and I said this it's it's a good opportunity, uh, and maybe see what happens to Canada over the next few years. Yeah. So what are you going to be doing for Rumble? Uh, well, legal work, we're, we're drafting and working on their uh, terms of service, implementing them because they're sort of expanding rapidly. They went public and it's there's that and then exclusive uh, exclusive uh, sort of content creation with them. Great. That's great. They're doing good stuff. I see the that Glenn Greenwald has a show. Um, yeah. Yeah. System up. Oh, I don't they're, they're, yeah. They're picking up everybody. It's it's Greenwald. Uh, uh, Ru- oh my goodness, Russell. What's his What's his first name? Oh, oh I know. You're talking about the British comedian whose name yeah. I can never remember either. I know. I know exactly. Oh, no, I that's going to drive. I, I I knew him as an actor before. I know. I know. Well, it'll come to us in a minute. We'll shout it out. Yeah. Just to interrupt you guys, I, I think you were referring to Russell Brand. Is that who? Russell Brand. Russell Brand. I just Googled it. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he's fantastic. I, I, I loved him and get him to the Greek in, in a meaningful way. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know why I can never remember his name. This is the second interview I've done where somebody's mentioned him and I can't get both parts of this. I don't know what that is. But so that's Steve, our, our audio producer who, who checks us on stuff. So that's great. It is Russell Brand who I have an enormous amount of respect for, especially the way he stepped out during COVID-19. Early on, you know, here's the thing, Viva, or David, whatever you prefer. Um, you know, I I'll, a lot of people are on board now with, with understanding that the COVID policy, as drawn by the global elites, was a disaster and not based on science, and that the idea that there was a consensus about it was complete nonsense and there there were many of us who understood that from the beginning um and Russell Brand was one of those people um and I don't know what to make of people who are bandwagoning on it now because you know for me it's like if you're not going to say what you believe to be true or what you suspect to be true when it's happening jumping on later is fine i guess it exerts pressure to get these guys to admit what they did. But, um, you know, I, I think people, people need courage, don't they? Well, I, I got the theory that, you know, courage is contagious. So there's a lot of people who are sitting on the sidelines, either too scared or just unsure. And that the longer things go on, uh, they become more inspired by other people who have spoken out. It's uh, I can understand it. It's sort of like the, the popularity thing or when people think it's cool, or acceptable to, to to start saying things publicly that they had otherwise kept hidden away, sort of with the with the trans debate as well. But uh, people can be late to the party so long as they're authentic and sincere and 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 doing it for good and not for uh, cynical or self serving purposes. Uh, more power to them. I mean, some people look at Russell Brand and say that he was too late, um, and yeah. that there were others out there earlier, Malone, Campbell, all these other doctors. Uh, or, and some celebrities who are out there earlier. So yeah. you're, you're never, unless you're first, and sometimes the first people there are are first. They're they're right, but not necessarily for the right reasons. So, yeah. Well, I was writing letters to American journalists in March of 2020, saying this is going to be a shit show, and here's why: because I'd covered Fauci and COVID, but nobody responded. It was really frustrating to watch legacy media fall all over themselves to help create this this narrative that's been so. So very destructive. But, I, I, you know, something I was late to the party on the trans stuff. And that's not because I I lack courage, but because I was so deeply into COVID and doing so much COVID science reporting and reporting on the tyranny around COVID that it kind of slipped past my transom. You know, I didn't. And then I interviewed Abigail Schreier and I started getting worried. And then the more I looked at it, the more the more I realized that it it kind of mirrors a story I exposed when I was at Fifth Estate about the satanic ritual abuse, recovered memory, uh, multiple personality disorder scam, which was also perpetrated by, you know, by the kind of academic elites. So I I picked up on it and then ran with it. But I was late to the party there, for sure. And I'm actually embarrassed by it. Well, the, the the party evolved over time. It wasn't always, I mean, look, when I started hearing about 
preferred pronouns, it was just preferred pronouns. And then it turns into uh, what they call, I don't know, know, gender affirming care, which was puberty blockers. And then it starts, then the party starts evolving into top surgery and bottom surgery and this for minors. So the the, the party itself changed at the beginning. Once upon a time, it was, it was Bill C-16 amending the criminal code to add gender expression as an aggravating factor for hate crimes. And I wasn't, um, late to the party I was watching. And I said, look, nothing to panic about just yet. And thought Jordan Peterson was uh, perhaps exaggerating his fears. Yeah. But the, the party evolved. Jordan Peterson proved right. a uh, Boy, howdy. And uh, and then <laughs> yeah. at some point, it's not even a question of feeling more comfortable speaking out. At some point, you say, like, this is getting shockingly outrageous. I have to speak out now, whether or not I feel uncomfortable doing it. That, that's sort of where I've gotten on the, on the trans issue, the euthanasia, uh, you know, situation evolving over time to being yeah. something absolutely uh horrifying horrifying and and covid i i i was i wasn't playing along but i was you know living it it's like okay two weeks to flatten the curve we'll make the best of it uh when they started locking outdoor dog runs that's when i started saying that i think that was <laughs> you know I, mean, I was like maybe april i'm like all right th- this is dumb we're being led by idiots <laughs> and it's all, it's been all downhill from there in terms of spiritual sanity (laughs) well and that's so funny because that really is in in a nutshell what's going on we're being led by idiots and what the connection i say this on the show a lot viva and that is that the connection to all of these crazy things right this trans ideology that's completely bonkers the idea that you uh, amputate the breasts off of teenage girl i mean it's just it's it's insanity right um and the covid um edicts, the the lockdowns and lots of the other stuff they did, the taping off of playgrounds and closing ice rinks and making us say goodbye to our loved ones. I mean, it was all absolutely nuts. And what the connection to all of these things that are driving critically thinking people around the bend, namely you and I and lots of others like us, is that it is ineptitude on behalf of the managerial class driven, I believe, by ideology, right? And and we've talked about this on the show a lot. And that was a Matt Walsh's What is a Woman? I, I, you know, I don't love everything Matt Walsh does. But, but I thought he was really smart, because he shows in the film, how completely toxic criticism is to these academics and doctors who are pushing it, right? One hard question to justify what they're doing, and they crumble like mm-hmm. a house of cards, right? And um, and that seems to be the underpinning thing in all of these terrible things we're going through right now. The censorship stuff, all of it is, in a sense, an aptitude of the managerial class who just don't seem to be that bright, aside from being uh, indoctrinated. Well, I, I, I've uh, it's it's a risky uh, evolution and stage where I'm at because I, you know, I, there's a concept called fractal wrongness where you know y- y- you make the wrong move at every single point in time, and it, you you couldn't even be that wrong by accident. <laughs> I, yeah. I've moved past the ineptitude. I, I, I genuinely think it's, you know, malice in quotes, yeah. but it's a, it's a form of deliberate, um, d- deliberate conduct because the more the government fails, the more they get to empower themselves to remedy the problems that they've created through their failure. And it's a make work project that allows them to increase their control over everybody. The worse things get, the more power they give themselves. Um, and at first I would have said ineptitude. Uh, and I said ineptitude for about a year. Yeah. Now I, I I thoroughly believe it's it's some form of malice. Uh, you know, n- not like uh, well, not not like cartoon villainry, but um, a, a government that that will um, capitalize and exploit its own failings to give itself more power. And we've seen it uh, with Trudeau in Canada, yeah. and and going back to the Nova Scotia shooting, government ineptitude that the government then either facilitated, allowed, or at the very least exploited after the fact to give themselves more powers to take away more rights from the citizens. Same thing with COVID. And with the trans debate, it's a whole different thing. I, I, I think there's some people who are innocent victims in the, in the discussion, and then there are malicious players. And then there's the corporate profiteering now that's going on with the hospitals. And once you turn something into an industry, it, it corrupts itself naturally. Well, I, you know what? I don't disagree with what you just said, even though it kind of contradicts what I just said. But I, I also believe that that can be true. And, and the reason that I do is because of the level of cruelty that's manifest 
in a lot of the things that they're doing, right? And that's what I couldn't wrap my head around during COVID. And it's been my driving principle in covering COVID is the inhumanity Mm-hmm. towards the citizenry by not just the government, but their public health officials, right? Suppress the virus at all costs. And if we kill 9 million people doing that, so be it. Um, and no, it was, right? But, uh, p- people were saying it at the beginning. I mean, I, I remember one of the earliest live streams I did with Robert Barnes on, on my channel where we were talking about it. And he was saying, it, do- it doesn't make sense because you're locking everything down. And if children are the vectors, which we now know maybe is not so much the case, but if children are the vectors and the elderly are the most vulnerable, what happens when you lock things down? You require the elderly to babysit the kids so that the working parents can go out and you effectively, in responding to one crisis, exacerbate it and create another. And, and the inhumanity side of it, I mean, m- making people say goodbye via ipad or or, or zoom yeah, calls and making kids hug through plastic sheets i mean it was dehumanizing and you know we're saying the same thing just viewing it from different angles i when i say I, you know accidentally dehumanizing i think it might be deliberately dehumanizing because you alienate dehumanize people so that the only place they can go for answers and for guidance is the government you destroy uh, community you destroy family you isolate people you you you, you create a 24 7 two-year cycle of, of of stress and anxiety and destroy all of the pillars of what were, uh, you know, Western valuable uh, principles of society. And people have no place but to turn to the government for those answers for that guidance. And, uh, you know, from from the trans stuff to the COVID stuff to the climate stuff, um, alienation, desperation, dehumanizing citizens so that they only look to the government for answers and guidance and security. I, I just want to ask you a question about that, because Obviously, we're on the same page on a, on a bunch of things. And I'll say that I'm not doing well after two and a half years of doing this work exclusively. And I'm not saying woe is me. I mean, lots of people had it way worse than I did. But there were some tragedies in my family that I haven't talked about yet um, that were caused by the uh, the COVID restrictions. Um, and I'm sure you had them too. But you also are swimming around in the same toxic soup that I am you know, for a living. Right. And I'm just wondering how you're doing. Like I, I'm pretty mad all the time and that's not a good thing, especially for a recovering alcoholic, which I am. Um, and I sort of don't know what to do about it. I can't quit the podcast because people rely on it. And I hear that more and more. Um, so I've got to find a way to, to kind of straddle a spiritual world, I guess, in this world, but, but how are you and how do you, manage it it's it's an interesting question that no one's ever asked because i have uh in general even in the best of circumstances h- high levels of anxiety and uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I i joke about you know <laughs> o- my my ocd but it, it's a joke because I'm, I'm very much aware of it but i'll stress and 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 obsess about things in the best of times and like yeah. when i was a lawyer Files would keep me up in the middle of the night. I would wake up sweating, thinking I forgot something. Mm. Uh, I was once told, you know, anxi- it's, it's a coat hook looking for a coat. And so whatever it is, it's, something's going to attach itself to it. And it could be a sunny day, uh, not a care in the world, and I'll, I'll stress about the fact that I have nothing to stress about. Uh, this, you know, it, it, this has exacerba- exacerbated some anxiety to some extent. Uh, on the other hand, it's also um, soothed some anxiety. In that uh, you realize that some of it's actually justified, but it's. I think the only thing that I, the bad thing that I've internalized is it's made me very, very cynical yeah. and uh, not distrustful in a bad way. I, I now look back at things that I was taught growing up. I look back at the you know the, the basic principles of, of of history that we were taught, and no longer uh, feel confident that I can believe any of it. Yeah. I, having lived through this, it is inconceivable that people can go back and trust what they've been told about the past. And that creates a massive amount of, of in, psychological instability, uh, spiritual instability, and, and deep, deep skepticism and cynicism, which is both good and bad in that it will be, you know, I, I won't fall for certain things again in the future. But see, the most frustrating thing about all of it is just trying to navigate the world with people who don't seem to have even realized this and you know, p- people, people who are still satisfied saying uh, Viva, that's a conspiracy theory. Uh, why would they do that? Why would the government want to do bad things to you? 
uh, they, they say this in the same breath that the government officials apologize for residential school atrocities. They say it in the same breath as CDC um, Director Rochelle Walensky apologizing to some extent for the Tuskegee experimentation. I mean, it, it, it's frustrating only to try to coexist with people who are living blindly, some out of um, convenience because life is busy and they don't have the time to get into it, and others out of, I think it's deliberate. It's just, it's too hard to deal with these fundamental realities that have been brought to our attention over the last two years. And what's been true of the last two years has been true of the last 200 years in one form or another. Well, I, I, I wonder if this isn't one of the reasons why so many investigative journalists are alcoholics <laughs> like me. <laughs> because I'll tell you why, because, well, now it's actually worse. Back in the day when I was doing that kind of work, as I'm sure you were doing a similar thing as a lawyer, you know, trying to get to the truth and holding people accountable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there was a kind of a collective consciousness in the viewing public and in the citizenry more generally that this was one of the righteous components of having a vibrant surviving democracy, right? Like I was very um, proud, I guess, of doing that work. And nobody does it anymore, right? Like it's like the, it's like holding people accountable in a, in a, in a very, very targeted way, no longer exists in the legacy news media, right? And, a- and, 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 and without that, these guys all know now, including our prime minister, these guys all know that no one is going to hold them accountable for lying, that no one is going to hold them accountable for screwing up the, the COVID pandemic response. And because the media is not signaling to the citizenry that they should be mad about it, right? The citizenry is going, oh, well, he didn't mean it. He didn't lie. He didn't this. He was abundance of caution, yada, yada. And so for me, seeing this happen when I spent the first sort of 20 years of my career holding bad guys to account in, in accountability docs for fifth estate to now see none of that happening and knowing that they know it is really, really scary. I mean, I don't know how we go on from this, this point actually. Well, I never knew uh, the, your, your history of, of, of alcoholism. And the question I'm even wondering is, was it functional alcoholism or, you know, like self-medication type or, you know, causing the problems type stuff. But I mean, to, to that, I would even still say, you, you know, for those for those of us who have the personality types that are prone to um, either it's call it self medication or internalizing the stress, you know <laughs> the, the, the stress yeah. of trying to hold people to account is one thing. I, I look at Stephen Colbert, and I imagine that he's got to go home and drink himself stupid so that he can sleep at night with what he's doing. So, yeah. you know, I, I think to one extent we'll be driven. Those who have the, the the propensity will be driven either through stress for pursuing purpose or for the stress of having sold out, uh, so they can try to sleep well. Uh, but it, it's not just that journalism is dead. It's, it's, it's actually being criminalized in real time by the government that is now saying, you know, uh, James O'Keefe-esque undercover journalism, which used to be the rage back in the 90s, is yeah. now criminal. Trespass, fraud, uh, fraudulent misrepresentations for people playing a, a role. And, you know, and the government wants to criminalize disclosure of information on the basis of you know, invasion of privacy, defamation, whatever, when it comes yeah. to actual news, it's being criminalized, but it's, 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 I'm seeing the evolution in real time. What happens when you buy off of the media and the media goes from being a government watchdog to a government lapdog, they all play into it together. And it's, they're all doing it to ensure their own security, ensure that they're the last ones, the last ones entering the gallows when, when, when everybody becomes an enemy. Uh, and it's, it's, it, I mean, it's just fundamentally discouraging, but flip side, uh, you know, one needs purpose. So it, it does, it does create the purpose because <laughs> yeah. I, I feel more productive doing this than I did as a lawyer, but, you know, pushing paper so that people could sue each other over contracts, it, it pays the bills and it's fun as an intellectual exercise. This has now become something of an existential exercise. Yeah, absolutely. Although I guess the reason I said lawyering had some purpose was that a lot of the cases we used to do at Fifth Estate and when I was in radio doing investigative work, you know, if there was, let's say, a pharmaceutical products liability case underway, I would call the lawyer and get their disclosure if they felt comfortable giving it to me. And that's how we got a lot of our kind of secret documents and and ways to hold accountable. So, you know, there is a group of people who always shit on lawyers. I don't. I think lawyers, especially if you look at uh, now uh, Janine Yunus, who is suing 
with the two attorneys general in the States to get the goods on the government collaborating with big tech. I mean, that is God's work, right? So, so some of that is, is, is really, really needed. Um, I want to, because I know we have limited time, which is sad because I'd like to have you on all day, but I want to move to, uh, first of all, China, because I, I think for probably for you like me, it's really unstabilizing to see governments and news media around the world going after China for doing what Trudeau did here and then them them saying nothing about it. So what what is that? Especially it's, a week after Trudeau lied on the witness stand. It's, it's path. Just before I forget, by the way, the good joke, which is actually a time tested and true rule. Ninety five percent of lawyers give the other five percent a bad name. Uh, Janine Eunice, uh, 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 Harmeet Dillon, Robert Barnes, Ron yeah. Coleman. There's there's a number of lawyers doing the Lord's work of law, yeah. but then the other 95% uh, really, really create a reputation. And <laughs> I, I, I'm not sympathetic <laughs> to those lawyers. Um, what's going on in China? Like, it, it, it's This is another thing where it's, it's inspiring, but it's also deeply, deeply, um, it, it makes you cynical. You realize that people have to rise up and people have to sacrifice themselves people have to die they have to get beaten by the government they have to get killed by the government before the world says enough is enough and before people say enough is enough but the the gaslighting hypocrisy of justin trudeau it, that's enraging to the point where i weigh my words publicly so that nobody you know can misconstrue what i said as any form of a a, a sincere threat. threat yeah but the, the the level of disingenuous gaslighting is enough to enrage uh, you know, a, a, a pastor where yeah. he comes out a year ago with the Indian farmer protests and says, we stand with the farmer's rights to protest. Um, it was, we support peaceful protest across the world, the right to be heard. Then fast forward nine months at the time or whatever, you have Ottawa protests where they violently suppress it after refusing to even engage with the yeah. protesters. And then a week after the commission where Justin Trudeau verbatim says, uh, it won't be verbatim, but it'll be pretty damn close. Uh, the idea of protesting to affect public policy change is something that I find worrisome. Yeah. He says this in his testimony, and the yeah. next week is supporting protest in China after acting in a manner that is similar in nature but not in extent to President Xi of China. It's enough to make you think you're going crazy that other people don't get enraged by listening to it. Well, they don't because of the point I made before, because the legacy media is not collecting the dots as you and I do. That is the point, right? He should be scrummed. In the olden days, if if somebody did what Trudeau was doing, the press corps in those days was, you know, bipartisan enough that he would have walked off the stand and been surrounded by angry reporters accusing him of not being honest, right? So the reason that the public, the citizenry, who don't listen to our shows are, you know, the ones who don't are, are, are not upset about it is because they don't know about it. I mean, Andrew Coyne is like praising Trudeau. I mean, it's, it's like unbelievable. It, so, it, you know, you know I, it, go ahead. It, Sorry. Oh, no, I, just, I was just thinking like, it, it's, he gets out there and says, I didn't call, I never called anybody names when there's video <laughs> evidence of him referring to the protesters as misogynist, anti-black, the anti-black racist, I think was a tweet, uh, extremists, uh, should yeah. we tolerate them? And, and no, it just it just gets a pass. But wh why wouldn't it? CBC, Radio Canada, indebted to the tune of 1.2 billion annually, a 600 million dollar bailout for printed media, a de facto COVID advertising bailout for digital media. They 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 can't um, they can't bite the hand that feeds them. And it's it's uh, it's a it's a preposterous joke. Looking at them online, it's pathetic. It's embarrassing. But they don't have dignity in the first place to even feel the shame for what they're doing. Well, it's weird, too, because I now believe also very strongly that uh, people of my generation of journalists uh, are complete, completely see the business differently than young people do. I, I know that they're being trained differently. I know they're being told to see the world only through a social justice lens, like they are in medicine and all kinds of other professions, too. It's a very, very dangerous ideology. And I sort of feel like I'm this old fart sort of shouting from the sidelines saying, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. You know, you really can do it a better way. But, but you know, and obviously we have a... You know, we have a constituency, but but I don't think that the young people in media today really understand the danger of what they're doing. They think, like Taylor Lorenz and the rest of the weirdos, that they're doing something noble 
by lying to people and, and arguing <laughs> against free speech and stuff. No, it's, it's, yeah, you're right. It's, they, they think that their lack of popularity is somehow a sign of their success. Noble. And, They're and, noble. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, the, the um, it's 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 that. And it's also that they've they've become sort of just dependent on big corporate bucks, which is not dependent on success, which is in this field determined by accuracy and, and honesty. Uh, yeah. and, and so it, it, they, it's, it's literally like journalists used to be, uh, for, the, for lack of a better analogy, wild animals. They used to be uh, you know, yeah. unbeholden to anybody. Yeah. And then slowly as you feed wild animals, they become dependent on the people feeding them and they become fat and lazy and no longer and no longer hungry for the truth just keep doing whatever it is they're doing to get the nut from the person at the park that being you know the government that being the big corporate uh enterprises <laughs> that are yeah. funded by big pharma and you know, just keep doing what you're doing and we'll give you a little nut and they they don't even realize that they would be more successful if they went independent and told right. the truth because the crowd you know there's the old expression uh sell to the sell to the rich no sorry sell to the Sell to the rich, live with the masses. Sell to the masses, live live with the rich. And I'm not. I'm using it in not an economic sense, but rather a spiritual one. The people who far outnumber the corporations want the truth, and they would be glad to support independent truth tellers. And but they don't realize it. It's it's more risky uh, yeah. financially. Uh, I guess also in terms of politically speaking, it's more risky. And they just lack the courage to do it. And they've gotten fat and lazy sucking at the government teat and big corporate media teat. And and also it's a club, right? It's a tribe now, too. And we really saw that during the um, the convoy where the media and certainly here I mentioned Andrew Coyne again, but they actually seem to have personal enmity for the truckers. Right. I mean, he called them hillbillies. I doubt he even ever met one of them. And yet the you know, and, and in the olden days, Viva, you know, we, we, I I say now, what are you politically? And I say, I don't know, but if I had to say it would be kind of a Woody Guthrie libertarian, right? Like I, I don't like a lot of regulation, but I think we must always look after our poor people and our working people. They're, they're the sacred, in my view, members of society, right? So I think that's, that's what that is. But, but media today does not identify with working people. They hate them. They hate them. And that is why Trudeau was so effective in turning the media and, of course, the managerial class who populate Ottawa against them because they saw them as these kind of dirty, you know, racist, stupid, anti-science jerks who actually, interestingly, were more right about the science of vaccines, you know, than, than not. So there has been a real a real shift in the 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 way that legacy media views the various kind of stratifications in the culture right now, they, they, they see themselves as the elites and they hate everybody else. That's no, and, 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 and they think that they know better than oh. people for their own lives. The, the ultimate irony is that it, 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 it's, it's the detachment, but it's also the, the bubble is that they live in is, is calling these truckers racist. And, yeah. you know, the, I, I was there interviewing, I interviewed an Iraqi uh, truck driver who, who fled from Iraq. I think it was in the eighties because yeah. of the life that he had there and yeah. said, now I see that life coming, uh, infiltrating here, yeah. uh, Polish, uh, a lot of Eastern European Venezuela. I mean, I, I, I interviewed uh, a member of a, uh, of a, an Albertan tribe and yet, the, you know, the media runs with Nazi flags. Trudeau comes out with racist missiles. I interviewed a trans individual who attended the protest and said that the only, uh, the only violence they experienced during the protest was when they crossed the line from the counter protesters to join the protest and the counter protesters who thought this individual was an ally realized they were an enemy. And then the insults and the slurs started flying. The, wow. it's, it's a level of detachment, but it, it succeeds in convincing enough people in general society who still only watch CBC, global news, uh, radio, CJAD 800, the most toxic crap on earth. Um, and and it, it, they succeed in convincing enough people that, Come election time, doesn't matter that the liberal government has just abused you for the last year plus, donated our protective equipment to China, knowing the pandemic was coming, exacerbated the deaths in long term health. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. They've been brainwashed to think, well, it, 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 it was for our own good. Let's reelect these buffoons. Well, you know, it is brainwashing. I, I believe that's true because 
I've tried to have conversations with people who are, you know, I use the word COVIDian because it just encompasses a lot. And it doesn't just mean COVID, it means other things too. And I'm sure you've had the same experience, Viva, where um, they glaze over. They glaze over. They, they, You can hit them with facts. They don't want facts. And it's like they don't want their own little personal bias uh, silo challenged with facts in any way. They take comfort in it. And this is why I, I get scared and why I have anxiety, because over the years, as certainly as a reporter, I've reported from Rwanda, I've reported from Asia, I've done all the big stories. Um, I always wondered how people slid into tyranny. How did it happen? What What was it about this cohort of people? that they slid into tyranny or genocide or whatever happened, right? I never understood it because as somebody living in a Western democracy um, and quite, being quite hopeful too and believing in the business I was in, I just didn't think it could happen here. And I will tell you that COVID and the um, the bankruptcy of legacy media has made me understand not just that it can happen here, but how quickly it falls if it does happen here, right? Like it can happen in a minute and our neighbors will be cheering it on as if it's a good thing. That's the danger that they don't even think it's a bad thing, right? That, that, that's that been my biggest black pill in all of this is I, I too, you know, I, 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 I don't often invoke my heritage, my religious heritage. My grandfather escaped Poland in 1936. Uh, the rest of his family, 24 some odd members stayed and, and did not make it out. Uh, and you say like, A, how could society have devolved to that point? And I can now see it, and I believe I've seen it in a, in a variation. I, I love the Mark Twain expression that history doesn't repeat, but it tends to rhyme. The, the idea yeah, that we, we've, we've, we've seen society devolve to a point where neighbors would rat out neighbors for having yes. people in their house, that, yes. uh, that, yes. that, that, that citizens would support the idea of taxing unvaccinated Canadians. The idea that well, I'd see a Canada where uh, people will now support the idea of allowing euthanasia for mental illness. I mean, you, you, you look back to, to what was the mercy killing program of, of the Nazis, I, you know, but for the fact that they used a different name, I, I can understand. You see how these things r recur over time, but they've given they, 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 uh, different enough that people could say, oh, it's totally different. Uh, back then, it was involuntary euthanasia. What we're doing in Canada is voluntary euthanasia, as if you can rely on someone who suffers from mental illness to voluntarily consent to anything, let alone death. Um, but you, you give it you give it a name. You give it a, a, a nice veneer and you can get neighbors to rat out family. You can get or neighbors to rat out neighbors, family to rat out family. You can get citizens to justify their discrimination against fellow citizens on the basis of fear. And after two years of being uh, indoctrinated with that fear from the government itself, people will say, yeah, sure. It's hey, you don't want to get vaccinated. No health care for you. You don't want to get vaccinated. You don't get into a department store. And they don't even stop to think about the absolute idiocy of the policy and the inhumanity of the policy. They've justified it to themselves because they have sunk themselves into the depths of despair where they have justified their own cruelty to themselves. Yeah, absolutely. That's so true. That's that was a tour de force, Viva. Thank you for saying those things because, you know, I had a woman on the show. She's been on a couple times. Ann Bauer, who is a a novelist um, from Minneapolis, but she moved away because her left wing friends were so angry at her over her protesting the school closures. She said she couldn't believe what happened to her tribe. Right. So she. She, I had her on because I wanted, I was struggling to look at the COVID restrictions through an artistic eye and art died completely during COVID, right? There was no music, there was no anything beautiful or, or worthwhile in that part of our lives during COVID. So I invited her on and she said a really interesting thing. She too is Jewish. And she said to me, after realizing that neighbors were snitching on neighbors, and other terrible things that her parents always told her to pick friends that she knew would hide them in the attic. Mm -hmm. And that was how she was kind of proceeding through the COVID regulations. And of course, when you, when you use those kinds of 
historic analogies, you have to put 88 caveats on it, obviously, because COVID's not the Holocaust. But you know what? It is the years leading up to the Holocaust. It is the six years before where science completely signed on to the idea that doing bad things in the name of public health was, was good, right? That is similar. I did a lot of reading on that. So so I thought that that was a really important thought from her. And I, you know, I well, never it's, it's, forgot it. it. Well, and, and, and it's the the risk is and it's the same cycle of discussion i have to go through with everybody when you when you analogize anything you say like well okay this is starting to rhyme it's it's not it's never repeating but it's starting to rhyme and they say how could you even compare it and then you know it gets into oh you, you shame on you for doing that i said well i i might happen to have actual family history tied to this yeah. So maybe it's not that uh, uh, maybe it's not that absurd. And, and then the response is, well, then you should know better. It's, it's, al- it's always the same. It's never identical. So you can't compare it. Well, it, it, one can look at other historical atrocities and how they occurred. People say it's, it's not there's no trains. Uh, so therefore you can't compare. All right. Yeah. Well, let's look at other uh, historical atrocities where people were starved en masse that led to, to mass death that led uh, oh, just say communism. To talk about the Ukrainian famine, the Holod- the Holodomor, hey, things which, okay, hey, it, it wasn't trains and murder. It was policy that led to massive amounts of deaths of innocent civilians. Uh, and now we're talking about, oh, the COVID, the COVID response from the government, which everyone has justified to themselves on the basis of saving granny, very benevolent. Well, it might lead to, you know, a few hundred million people starving to death globally. But, you know, at least they're not in our backyard. So we can wash our hands of that. I wanted to save granny. I'm virtuous in the decisions that I've supported that are going to lead to hundreds of millions of people starving to death. Um, I, I, well, you know, we, we, they called it mercy killings back in the day. We call it euthanasia, maids. It's such a beautiful, it's such a beautiful um, uh, you know, acronym that, that hides what's been going on. That's leading to 10,000 people being euthanized in Canada in 2021 alone. But we, we found a way to morally justify that to distinguish it from historical atrocities. Uh, it, it really is. I, I see the way we're even looking in retrospect. I can understand how people at the time of the atrocities justified them to themselves. Absolutely. I, can, Absolutely. I look back to, to Rwanda yeah. where they, you know, oh, yeah. we, we have to do it. It's an existential crisis. It, it's, it's different only in degree, but not in essence. And Rwanda was very much a public relations or a propaganda campaign by the president, right? He like when I heard Trudeau demonizing unvaccinated people, I went immediately to Rwanda, given the language he was using. Obviously, the Rwanda radio broadcasts that were absolutely critical in inciting the mayhem there, the literally murder and mayhem there, were more extreme than what our prime minister did. But they were in the same vein. Right. It was let's demonize and dehumanize a part of the population in Rwanda, a tribe in the population that I don't like right now. Right. So so that felt very, very real to me. And I'm not a person. I don't I'm not an extremist. I don't run around calling things similar to the to the run up to the Holocaust. I don't think I've ever made that analogy in 40 years as a journalist ever. And and from my perspective, I will say, like, I am not Jewish, but I'm a citizen. Right. And and um, I, I covered uh, many. I, I covered the Hidden Children uh, reunion in New York, the first one where the ki- all the kids who'd lived in the woods and been dressed as little girls and told to tell people they were Catholic and hidden and addicts. They all got together in New York at this remarkable meeting. And I made friends with Abe Foxman, who ended up becoming the head of the Anti-Defamation League. Um, you know, so so I don't. I, you know, I don't, there's nothing anti-Semitic or not understanding the history here, although I do understand why people, why Jewish people obviously have a claim on it. But but let me just finish. Well, just, yeah, uh, PJ, what I want to say about it is, you know, that the, the slogan is never again. And so if it is never again, we have to be able to talk about a creep, right? We have to be able to talk about if we feel, all of us, if we feel something creeping up that feels historically dangerous, we have to, all of us have to be able to talk about it in a responsible way, don't we? I, 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 um, some, sometimes you can use flippant references to historical atrocities and, and other times they are, it's, you cannot be precluded from learning from history simply because it might be politically incorrect to 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 learn from history, uh, yeah. you know it's it, the Godwin's law that every you know every every debate uh, degrades into someone calling someone Hitler. 
<laughs> if you if you don't learn from how governments have abused of emergency orders to a retain power indefinitely or b justify discriminatory policies against citizens, you, you're bound to repeat it. And uh, uh, but uh, only in in degree. I, I don't find uh, flippant comparisons. I've never. Uh, I, I don't. I don't get radically offended by them. I just they're flippant and and sometimes just juvenile. Uh, yeah. e- even back in the day when Gina Carano uh, posted that Instagram post that got her in trouble, I said, yeah, it's risky to make certain analogies because mostly because it'll be maliciously weaponized by a disingenuous media to go after the yeah. person and not actually address the issue. Um, but if, if we don't learn from, from history, we will be bound to repeat it. And those who have learned might just be uh, doomed to sit there and watch it repeat to one extent or another. But listening to Justin Trudeau say, do, should we tolerate these people? Ugh. I mean, there's anybody who's not going to say that that rhymes with cut down the tall trees in Rwanda or, uh, you know, th- those people are existential threats. If there's anybody who's going to listen to that and not acknowledge that that could be a political permission slip to people who want to justify their intolerance in the most extreme of ways. Oh, like, I don't know, by ramming into protesters with a truck in Winnipeg. Uh, yeah. If there's anybody who listens to that and doesn't hear it rhyming with history, that would be the evidence as to how history tends to repeat. And back in the day, they heard their leaders uh, literally refer to their fellow citizens as vermin and thereby allow other citizens to justify inhumane treatment of their fellow citizens. Should we tolerate these people? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's shocking. It, it, it's disqualifying at, at best. And yet too many people just, they just, they just tolerate it and they just move on. Well, because the media supports it, right, instead of calling it out. Um, It's interesting because, you know, obviously, I feel like the people in Ottawa were kind of um, infatuated with with the kind of language that he was using, given how how many of them seemed to have turned against the, the convoy. At least there were many vocal people. Uh, who did. And that was very frightening to me, too, because it means that people listening to somebody like our prime minister through a certain uh, propagandized lens stop seeing how dangerous they are, right? And even you and I, let's just be clear here, you said earlier in this conversation, and it really hit home with me, that, yeah, we're criticizing the prime minister. No one is calling for violence here. So you and I, when we do this, we watch our language, right? Like if I say this guy's got to go about the prime minister, I always follow it up by saying, I don't mean that literally. It's a political, right? Because they will come and twist that into a threat being made against the prime minister, which is a really, really scary position that we're in because the media will go after Anybody who's criticizing the prime minister in a in a let's say uh, vivacious way, <laughs> it, 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 it's part. It's also part and parcel of the government suppressing free speech and demonizing any. And they 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 referred to it as this during the pro, during the uh, public order emergency commission anti authoritarian rhetoric. Call any form of anti authoritarian. Call any form of critique of the government anti authority rhetoric. Anti authority rhetoric that. Uh, might incite violence or could be misconstrued as violence. It's it's part and parcel of the game. Uh, you know, the, the, they they can say something like, "Should we tolerate these people?" But if anybody dared say, "Should we tolerate Justin Trudeau?" They would turn that into some form of real yeah. threat. Go after the person, criminalize them, arrest them, suppress freedom of speech. Um, and uh, but th- that's that's part and parcel of the of the of the game for power. It's like I, I don't even I don't even use analogies that could be misconstrued. Uh, yeah. I, I, this wasn't about a politician, but it was about uh, a court decision. I said, it'll make someone's head explode. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm not going to use that on Twitter. <laughs> that can be misconstrued. That can be. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if, for, for good or for bad, some people call it you know, being a little too milk toast or, 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 or scaredy cat. Uh, I, I, I watch my words, but you see it in real time. The weaponizing of, uh, of, of, of the meaning of words itself so they can go after some people, critics typically, while tolerate exponentially worse rhetoric from uh, their political allies. Yeah, it's absolutely true. And you know where we see that the technique of that is in the headline too, where the headline, I just saw this on Twitter. Someone was saying, yeah, people are saying, we're saying they wanted violence against the prime minister. And then they post an article with a very, I think it was a CTV, very inflammatory headline. 
And then you read the article and there's literally no threat of violence in it at all. They said people were being rude or something, right? Or they're being too like aggressive. But that's not aggression is not necessarily violence. And rudeness is part of the political process, especially when people are upset. I mean, this is a guy who took a knee to Black Lives Matter, who had well, were burning America to the ground at the time. Um, so I, I think what we need to really focus on with him is what you said earlier. And that's the idea that he said out loud, he doesn't like protests that question what was the phrase government policy or yeah, it's, it's to affect public, to, to affect policy change. The, uh, wow. the, the I, amazing thing is after one of the protests <laughs> uh, at the end of one of the protests, when I'm documenting, I'm walking around with my camera and I, I sort of shut it down and I see uh, an elderly Chinese couple following me. Uh, um, and so I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like looking over my shoulder because they were they were following me and they were waiting until I put my camera down. And then I put my camera down and I see the individual comes up to me and he says, are you recording? And I said, no, this is good because I, I don't want to be on camera. He said, when, when I heard Trudeau talk about a fringe minority holding unacceptable views, I, I heard that verbatim in China, in my own language, ver- verbatim. And I said, when I heard that, that's when I genuinely got scared here because that was exactly the type of rhetoric. Uh, ver- he said verbatim. I don't know what the words are in, 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 in Mandarin. Or, yeah. uh, he said verbatim. And it's like, it's, I don't think that's an accident. I, I don't think Trudeau's rhetoric is an accident. I don't think it's the result of speaking off the cuff. It's, it's, the, um, it's, it's the actual public tolerance of this type of rhetoric, and it's a vicious circle. He, he, he creates the environment and then gets away with using rhetoric that he would not tolerate anyone else using uh, if he were the object of it. But I just, it, that was what, something that stuck with me is our, yes. our, our, our prime minister using communist China rhetoric. Yes to demonize and divide uh, his own citizens. You're not, I, I heard that too. That that story actually makes me sad, but I, I heard that same response from two people who, two uh, people from mainland China who said the same thing. You know, they're kind of dissidents and they, they said the same thing where you guys are, and we're going through here the kind of cultural revolution that beset our country. And, and, and when we talk about the idea that, You know, you and I had a reaction to certain things that happened that made us frightened for democracy and that other people didn't. When I heard unacceptable views, I thought like, man, like, is he going to get it? Like, this should be a headline. Who wrote that for him? What is he? How can he say that? And I guess most people in this country didn't respond to it that way, right? I, 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 my whole DNA was on red alert when I heard that phrase, but I guess my neighbors thought it was fine. No, because (laughs) because they have been... They have been whipped into a frenzy where they thought if someone is five feet from me, I'm going to die from COVID. I, I, they, they've been whipped into a frenzy where the, the unvaccinated were literally vectors of immediate death and doom. Uh, I, I had a discussion with a smart person, a, a smart individual who, who you know, has a good functioning brain. And we're talking and I just asked, you know, what do you think my chances are of, of dying if I get COVID? And the person said, well, four, four or five percent. I was like, how do you figure that? And the person said, well, four or five percent of the people who die are, are in your age bracket. I was like, that's that 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 made sense to you in your head as as an interpretation of statistics is yeah. evidence as to how broken your brain has gotten under the yeah. current system, under the current environment. And but people's brains are broken. You had people walking around like otherwise, I presume sensible people. Complaining when people entered their six foot bubble, thinking that this mask was was holy water that would protect them from Satan himself. And so it's just, yeah, of course. Hey, that, that's not the worst of it. I'd rather I, I don't want to deal with people with unacceptable views if they're going to cough in my face and kill me and my grandmother. It, it, it's just the environment of insanity that we're living through. Absolute, absolute madness in which what had never been conceivable to be tolerated in Canadian society has become normal and acceptable. And if that's not enough of an analogy to historical atrocities, if you had asked anyone three years ago if they would tolerate any of this, it would have been a categoric, no, what the hell do you think this is? Uh, Some dystopian nightmare uh, China-esque future. And then yet, fast forward two and a half years, 24-7 media fear porn can really have an impact on even reasonable, sensible people. So I want to play now um, Marty up north, who has a pretty good Twitter Twitter account, put together a compilation of Trudeau lying um, with regard to his denying of saying any of this stuff while he was under oath 
at the commission hearing. So I just want to play that and then get your response to it. Trying to bring people together is not always compatible with science, with respect for human rights, with the best way to move things forward. I mean, when Aaron O'Toole talks about, oh yes, we need to unite people, we need to bring people together, he's talking about defending the rights of people who are anti-vax. Yes, there is a small fringe element in this country that is angry, that doesn't believe in science, that is lashing out with racist, misogynistic attacks, but Canadians, the vast majority of Canadians are not represented by them. And I know will not allow those voices, those special interest groups, those protesters who can, I don't even want to call them protesters. The overwhelming majority, close to 90% of Canadians have done exactly that. The small fringe minority of people who are on their way to Ottawa or who are uh, holding unacceptable uh, views uh, that they're expressing. You don't want to get vaccinated. That's your choice. But don't think you can get on a plane or a train besides vaccinated people and put them at risk. Oui, on va s'en sortir de cette pandémie par la vaccination. Puis on sait, on en connaît tous des gens qui sont en train d'hésiter un petit peu. On va continuer d'essayer de les convaincre. So obviously, uh, Viva, you speak much better French than I do. So if you want to just translate oh, yeah. the last bit, which is sort of the juicy bit, isn't it? Uh, that was uh, Le Quatre, <laughs> le, le quatre Semaines de Julie. That's when uh, Julie, I forget what her last name is, has Justin Trudeau on. And he says, um, the, this, this, small, the, this small group, they're, they're, they're extre- oh, she says they're extremists, referring to anti-vaxxers. He doesn't really yeah. acknowledge or deny. He just goes on. They, they don't believe in science. They're oftentimes misogynist. Uh, and we have to make a decision as a society. Do we tolerate these people? Is it verbatim translation? Do we tolerate these people? Um, it, it's, it's, it, it, someone's going to say, well, that's not an overt call to violence. Mm, I, 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 that, that is an implicit call to political violence, uh, constitutional violence. Uh, by the way, the, Le Quatre de Julie is also where they had those two young kids being prompted by their teacher saying, what should we do to anti-vaxxers? And the kid, the kid said, arrest them or call the police. I forget which. And then the other one said, in, it, and it was, the, the optics of it were just so horrific. It's a, it's a, it's a young blonde girl saying in, in French, and I'll translate my, from memory of it, uh, you have to cut them little by little uh, until they submit, until they comply. Il faut, il faut les couper petit à petit jusqu'à temps qu'ils soumettent, or jusqu'à temps qu'ils, I think she said submit. Uh, using children... For political, violent political, or at least constitutionally violent political propaganda, geez, where have we seen that before? Pretty much in every tyrannical regime that has ever existed in, throughout the history of humankind. Atrocious. Yeah. Atrocious. And and yet on the witness stand, he he denied that that ever happened. Let me ask you about that. I know you've got to go. Can we have 10 more minutes? Oh, yeah, for, sure, for, sure, okay. for sure. Okay, good. Thank you. I want to ask you about this because I did, I spoke to somebody who was with the, um, the Justice Center, who'd been representing them at the hearings. And I, is it mean for me to say that I was dissatisfied with some of the questioning? In other words, when when Trudeau blatantly lied about that, I, I was hoping that the lawyer would create a moment. I mean, Canadians deserve a moment where where he's not allowed to get, I mean, look, at you know, the media is not, not going after him. And I thought, oh, well, they'll, you know, they'll be able to, to expose something here. And yet I didn't find, is it wrong for me to say that she was prepared or aggressive enough with him? What was your response to watching that, well, that uh, uh, cross-examination? Well, uh, cross-examination sort of, I guess. I, as I, I'm, you know, I always take a step back and, and just make sure not to be uh, reflexively judgmental of attorneys. It's always sort of like the, the contractor who comes in to look at a job always complains about the work that the previous contractor did. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very much, you know, self-aware to, to have that reflex. Yeah. Um, uh, my 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 now thought thought out or thorough let me say more thoughtful analysis. Trudeau's testimony was set up in a way that it would be exceedingly difficult to make him look bad. He had two hours in chief with uh, Attorney Sh- Sh- Chaudhry. Uh, yeah. You know she wasn't adverse by any means. She's supposed to be the commission's attorney, so neutral. But I yeah. mean, there's 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 softball questions, and then there's 
I'm not trying to get at the truth anymore. I just want to give Justin the opportunity to look as good as humanly possible. So he had two hours of that in chief. Um, and then the other parties in cross who are adversarial by nature had five or 10 minutes yeah. in, in, in a, as a matter of, you know, strategy in law, it's impossible to make someone look bad in five minutes. It's impossible to get what you need yeah. in 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. the, and, you know, if they had had the montage ready, queued up for him to contradict yeah. him, well, the, the actual, um, the circumstances wouldn't allow it because you, you, you have to disclose the documents you intend to invoke. You can't just pop them up like in a regular cross-examination. Had they filed that montage as an exhibit, you know, stating their intention to invoke it during cross Trudeau would have been prepared. The bottom line, it, it, it wasn't necessarily, it was set up to not be um, feasible to make Trudeau look bad on the stand. It's yeah. the ex post facto analysis and the ex post facto um, uh, dissection of it. That is where the media is supposed to come in and say, you pathological liar said you didn't call people names. And here is you know a, a slew of it. Uh, you came up and said, uh, I, 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 a number of things that were just inaccurate. It, it's the media's job to do that after the fact. Some have been doing it to like the most minor of degrees, but that's where I think, you know, the independent uh, anti-authoritarian uh, media, like my, you know, like, like us will, will put it together. But the only problem is uh, that the people listening to CBC are, have already tuned us out because the CBC said we're radical extremists. And so they just yeah. are now just not even listening to it. But I think the saddest reality is people just don't care. They just want one more day of peaceful life. They want to yeah. be left alone to some extent. They want to yeah. work their jobs. They want to worry about, you know, and, and understandably so. And until it comes to their front door, uh, they won't care. That's a very interesting take on it. You know, I mean, I, I, I'll just, I'm not bragging on myself, but but there are times, and maybe it's because I'm an investigative journalist and I grew up watching Mike Wallace and I believe in creating those moments. And I, I know that you understand them from, you know, the witness stand, <laughs> having people at the witness stand who reveal something they don't want to reveal. Um, that I, I, and I have deep sympathy for the circumstances that the lawyers were under. I really do. But, you know, it would have been great if, if maybe the people interviewing Trudeau on the adversarial side had said, you know, I want to enter into the record that 10 minutes is not enough for us to do what we need to do here and that we are registering a complaint that this process is unfair. Something, some public acknowledgement that we are all involved in a fake idea here so that it doesn't look like they're playing along. I know this is Monday morning quarterback. No, but it's, it's also, but, I just say, it's so idealist also. This is this is on the 43rd day of a commission. The general public <laughs> fell asleep after two hours. So, you know, I always I say, know, like, I everybody know, thinks the rest of the world is going to care about their lawsuits and how they've been wronged. And by and large, nobody does. I mean, you'll find a few people who are interested, but it's like, yeah. People get into their own lawsuits and how the court systems court. And it was like, yeah, yeah, okay. Look, I, I hear people complain all day long. Nobody would have cared. Uh, it was impossible to, it was very difficult to have that Matlock moment. And <laughs> I'm not even convinced that they would have been able to admit that montage as evidence because the whole purpose of this commission had a, had a very targeted object, which is self-serving. It was to investigate the circumstances surrounding the invocation of the act. Things Justin Trudeau said nine months earlier tangentially relevant they could have had it as a montage just to embarrass trudeau uh, but then you waste your 10 minutes they had 10 minutes i know and it was a tight time you waste seven minutes on a montage and then you don't get to ask any questions and people are going to say what the hell man you had him on the stand and you asked him nothing um <laughs> it was it was, it was designed to be the way it it, it to un, 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 uh, unfold the way it unfolded uh but it is in the it's in the ex post facto dissection that people are supposed to put the lies together and yeah. and broadcast them a full blast, which is what I plan on doing so long as um, so long as I can. Yeah, me too. Well, you know, then then the question becomes and this is a big question and I'll ask you because I know you've thought about it. If the media is not holding to account and the hearings can't actually hold, they can document, but they're not holding to account and the opposition isn't really holding to account, then we what we're left with is actually we are in a post-democracy world now. And I, I feel that very, very strongly. It's another reason I have anxiety too, mm -hmm. because I feel that we have crossed a line, that the thing that you and I feared and other smart people feared was going to happen has already happened. And I think that Prime Minister Trudeau is kind of exhibit A in that sense. 
I don't want to get too black pilled, but uh, I, I share that sentiment. <laughs> I mean, I, the, the commission ended. And the judge yeah. uh, last Friday in his closing statement says, you know, okay, the, this is the fact finding portion is over. I, I'm comfortable. I've got the facts to come to my conclusion. And I was optimistic. I said, well, I'll get there in a second. Then he says, next week is the policy discussion. And I thought the judge said it wasn't going to be broadcast. So I wasn't paying attention to watching the commission this week, but it is being broadcast. And where I was listening to these, I don't know, government appointed experts, pundits contemplating uh, the idea of freezing bank accounts of protesters if they're told to disperse and don't disperse within 48 hours, as, as though yeah. these are these are legitimate forms of government to bypass any due process, any judicial um, checks and balances, just to say we've declared an emergency, a protest spanning four blocks of the capital of Canada. And therefore, one of the guys literally said it. Well, in the context of emergencies, we can sort of bypass standard constitutional rights. And I was screaming at my computer, no, you, 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 you propagandist government Jack and any in it's, it's specifically in times of crisis when you have to guarantee and ensure the basic constitutional charter rights, not bypass them because it's an emergency. That's how you get from democracy to tyranny, fascism, communism, whatever you want to call it. But I, I, I I'll, I've said it before and I'll say it again, cause it's, it's, it's true. If the commissioner Hulo comes back, with anything other than a stern reprimand of Justin Trudeau having invoked the Emergencies Act. If it's anything less than that, I will feel comfortable in saying that Canada as a democracy, as a free uh, beacon of, of what society can be, is, is done. And what you're going to have, massive exodus of wealth, intellect, and anybody who can afford to leave the country is going to. And we're going to see, if it happens, we can see in real time the actual fall of a nation constitutionally, economically, socially. And my goodness, you know, we saw what happened in Venezuela over three decades. Well, we might witness it in Canada over five years. Yeah, I, I look, I completely agree with you. I think it's really, really, really well said. And I, I, there's a couple of things I want to say before I let you go. And one of them is thank you very much for being our eyes and ears during the convoy. You did something that w was really historically important. And it taught me something, you know, I'm, I'm old school, I, I'm not um, that particularly tech savvy, you know, I'm women, I'm a woman, and I'm aging. So so those things are scary for me. And I didn't fully understand the um, importance of, of the live stream as a pillar of, of democratic mm -hmm. information. And I will tell you, you were our eyes and ears down there. Like I live for your live streams. I really did what you did. I don't know if you knew how important it was when you were doing it, but, but it was so very, very important for me. I couldn't go down there. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to really see what was happening and I saw it through you. I, I knew Tamara and I knew Chris and I, I made judgments about them both positive judgments but you still needed to see what was happening on the ground. And you and the other live streamers really made a big, big difference in this country. And I hope you, um, even though you probably have bad days, I hope you can sit on your laurels a little bit on that. No, I, 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 I can never sit on my laurels. The other thing is, you know, nobody knew what it was. Nobody knew what it was going to turn into. When I, when I went down there, yeah. I, 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 just, I, I went down there, not out of curiosity. I just went down there to say, like, look, if this is what I'm being told it is, uh, the, the world will see it for good or for bad, and <laughs> yeah. and then I mean yeah. then then it became uh, it, be, it 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 exploded into something like just you know it, it was people from across the world were watching this in real time, and then it's like yeah. one of those things where you just wish you could stay up twenty four hours a day and leave your family yeah. for three weeks on end. Um, yeah, it, yeah, the the, the the live streaming, the documentation in real time, it's the only thing that really can't be uh, easily falsified. Yep. Yep, yep. easily memory hold and so you know when I, I'm, I'm working with the with, with the platform rumble you know, I, i'm less concerned about things being memory hold on rumble but i was legit concerned like at the end of the day they're just gonna they're gonna they're gonna pull my stream from youtube and people are not going to see what's actually going on and they'll be more easily able to just swallow the lies coming out of the cbc uh radio mm -hmm. canada ctv or whatever it, it, it's um it was it was an absolute monumental experience and uh, what's, what fascinated me is how the mainstream media didn't understand what, no. what made it what it was. It wasn't, you know, W5, when they ran their one of their hit pieces on me, 
you know, referred to me as something like they said, something of a celebrity because he provides information in an unfiltered manner. I was like, don't you understand <laughs> that that's what that's all that anybody wanted? I, no, I don't want your filter. I don't want your judgments. I just want to see it and I'll come to my own conclusions. I don't need you to tell me what to think. And they don't understand that yet. No, they still think people are rubes and they think that people are dumber than them. And they are the ones in a position to filter and tell them what to think. And they, they, they won't understand it. And I think it will lead to their ultimate financial um, influential decline and collapse. And I, I can't hope to, it, it can't happen fast enough, but flip side, I got it. You know, the, the, the pressure is always there to main, to, to maintain integrity, to not get yeah. up in what I believe. Uh, and, and, but, the, but I think I have the introspection and self-reflection to, to, to keep that in balance. Yeah, it's a tough call because, the, you know, the left and the legacy media are just mostly wrong about everything, right? And I was giving a talk the other night about media to a, at a big banquet. And, um, and I said, you know, it's really good to have independent media, but the independent media can't always view everything through a conservative lens either. Because if we're left with two tribes getting information from two filtered sources, we're not going anywhere. We have to restore some faith in the dignity of actual objective investigative journalism in this country, right? And, and if we don't do it, having a really powerful conservative media isn't going to solve that either, as much as I support conservative media too. Um, we need something where people can just feel that they're not having their, their confirmation bias appealed to on their social media, but it's something that can be, I don't like to use the word trusted because legacy media uses that and they've bastardized it now. It, the word, it's a word with no meaning, it's, but the right? word is transparent. Like uh, it's transparent. Yeah, if transparent. I make a mistake, if I'm biased, if I, if I, if my perspective is now skewing what I, the way I interpret things, it's full transparency. I'll get called out and rightfully so. Um, but I, it's it's the transparency that that legacy media does not want and cannot stand. Nope, they can't um, stand it. But it's it's the transparency is that which keeps the honest honest, and it's why uh, the honest don't mind transparency, and why the dishonest always prefer to do things under the the cloak of darkness. And look at Tim Cook trying to kick Twitter off their app store. I mean, wow. That, that that just... have, apparently that turned out to be a rumor, uh, and then the question is why Tim Cook would have allowed that rumor to linger for a couple of days. Um, but apparently, apparently Elon has confirmed that that's not their intention. Uh, but uh, pulling the advertising in as much yeah. as they're well within their rights to do it, uh, you know, they're, they're fighting a war. They're, it's, it's a different type of war now. It's being fought with information, being fought with money and being fought with uh, censorship. And uh, well, it's, 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 a, it's quite a time to be alive. I just I, I, there's part of me that wants to get to the end of this so we can see how it ends. But then, you know, I saw the movie Click with Adam Sandler. Once you get to the end of the story, there's no rewinding in real life. So maybe it's, you know, we, we have to enjoy the moment as we live through this revolutionary time. Is your personal life okay? Oh, yeah. Touch wood, poop, kadena, horror, the, every, everything's good. We moved to Florida. It's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a three-year um, plan now. We'll see yeah. if, if we decide to make it, you know, permanent. Um, yeah. It's not easy. I, I you know, I, I didn't have very many friends that I left. I left everything back home. Uh, wow. But you know, for for kids, it's it's a little it's a little harder. Uh, you know, for the, yeah. de depending on the age, it's been yeah. one heck of a costly learning experience. I mean, the, the, you know, we're hem hemorrhaging. It's it, it's a difficult thing to move. It, it's not something that everybody can do. Just the, the costs, uh, unforeseen costs, are are almost prohibitive. The stresses yeah. for those who don't deal well with stress and uncertainty are uh, are, are insane. But the reality is like, I, I can't, I'm not, I can't live in a place where my 12 year old daughter is living in a world where they say at 13, you're not playing soccer. If you're not vaccinated, I'm not, I, I'm not living in a, in a, in a world like that. And, and I'm saying vaccinated for COVID. This is not vaccinated for, for, you know, a, a true vaccine with the history and safety record. This is real time. And I'm quoting Obama here. I'm not making my own statement, real time experimentation, not on my, not on my kids. What I decide, you know, and I'm not living in a country where we think that we can ban unvaccinated from going to movies, you know, restaurants, uh, departments. I'm not living in that type of society. Um, yeah. I, I missed my son's graduation from Dalhousie, by the way, because I couldn't fly there. It's, so. it's, 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 it's inhumane. It's dehumanizing yeah. people not going to funerals. This is these are crimes against humanity. They're not on par with, with other crimes against humanity, but they're nonetheless crimes against humanity. D stripping humans of their humanity, of their most core 
their most core uh, elements, religion, family, their own human. It's a crime against humanity. And the only question now is really how bad is it going to get and how bad has it gotten, depending on what we find out as as information gets released over the, the, the days, weeks and years to come. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. And what I, it's interesting what you said about humanity, because I say on this show a lot, having interviewed all the big, co, you know, a- anti Covidian names, the credible ones, we didn't talk about uh, died suddenly, I guess we don't have time, but I did. <laughs> Oh, we, we can do it. Well, let's let's. Uh, I, I put well, let's a- talk about it. let's talk about it because I I let I'll tell you what I think, and then I I want to hear what you think. But so so I I was a science journalist, and that's what informs what I do. And science is actually on the side of the COVID heretics, actually, as you well know. So um, you know, Stu Peters is the guy who did what's in the water, alleging that that snake venom was dumped into our water system, and that's what's causing COVID. So. Now he's got a new film that I do believe people are dying suddenly, probably from vaccines. And I also think some of them are maybe suicides or other things that happen as a result of lockdowns. But it's really hard to hang my hat on anything connected with him. And that, and also, look, I'm a do- I just produced a five part documentary for Amazon Studios. That was the last thing I did before COVID, right? Like I am a big time documentary producer director. That's what I did. And so um, I, I know what you have to do to prove a point and be credible, and they're not doing that. And frankly, Viva, I think it's going to hurt us. I, I, we, we share that sentiment. My, my, my experience with Stu Peters had been, and I talked about this on my channel, I did a, a whole you know, segment. Um, I, I met, I, the first time I became aware of Stu Peters was when Pat King, that news broke and Pat King discovered the cure for COVID, how to end the lockdowns. <laughs> eight, I think it was the summer of 2021. He beat yeah. his ticket. He subpoenaed uh, Dina Hinshaw, or if it was someone else, it, it, and and he was on Stu Peters. And Stu Peters said, "You've got you've you've done it. We've it's over now." And I watched it, and I was like, "This doesn't sound right." I looked up yeah. Pat King's situation. He didn't beat the ticket. He didn't do anything, and, and not, with no fault to Pat King, he contested it and he lost, as did every, you know a lot of other people. But I said that was um, either a misunderstanding, a deli- you know, it was a misunderstanding or something worse. Uh, then there was the snake stuff and i went to watch this documentary and i and i said it's a well-produced it's compelling uh, you know good good music good editing nice drone aerials uh but i said you know i I just said it before anything had even broken in the news i said that montage when they have people collapsing it's like yeah you know you got to vet each and every one of those images to make sure none are none are uh out of context or predate and then sure enough a couple days later the, the, the basketball player who collapsed on his face, that was that was pre-vaccines. And so now it allows yeah. everybody to say, we, we, you know, this entire documentary is 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 bunk. Anybody who cites it is automatically discredited. And yes, it, yeah. it causes problems for what are otherwise known and, and, and reported on by mainstream media problems. I, I don't yeah. need um, a, a propagandist uh, taken out of context, misleading documentary to to show that. Uh, you know, unexplained deaths is now the leading cause of death in Alberta. Excess death in New Brunswick, uh, you know, are, are, needs explanation. Um, that, the, you know, insurance claims uh, are, are up 40% for working-aged individuals. I don't need the propaganda when we have even mainstream yeah. you know, making those points. And, yeah, people were running around saying this is the best thing ever, sharing it, sharing it. And now all of them are going to have to um, deal with the fact that they're going to be written off as having – yeah, jumped on the bandwagon of, of something which is glamorized at best and misleading at worst. Thank you for saying that. I said it on last week's show, and I, I actually was expecting some pushback, but I didn't get any. I did get some responses when the snake venom story came out with, you know, Brian Artis as their expert and no challenging. I mean, I watched it carefully and it was it was laughably bad. Mm. And uh, I, I think what happens, Viva, with people, as part of my listeners and probably yours, too, is that everybody is so destabilized by these information wars that they they almost will believe anything because it feels like we're living in this very, very sinister time. That's how I explain QAnon too, by the way. I think QAnon wouldn't exist if people weren't feeling that they were being abused informationally. Um, and, and I think that that's what holds this up. So people would say to me, well, why aren't you talking about about what's in the water? And I'd say, well, yeah, you know, can't, won't do it. But people were angry and I don't know where died suddenly is I the last time I looked they had nine million views and I thought wow you know if they're charging a dollar a view I mean somebody's getting very rich and 
And you know, it, it doesn't help. And there's a new film coming out um, by David Francie. Do you know this? It's, it's the new one. Um, and it's by a guy who covered AIDS in San Francisco back in the day when I was covering it too. So I know him. He did a great film called How to Survive a Plague, which was brilliant has done a documentary that is for HBO, Google it. It's called How to Survive COVID, I think, or something like that. Rave reviews by all the variety and everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's a total sop to the vaccine. You know, it's like Fauci is a hero. Albert Borla is a hero. This is what, I mean, it's just, so you've got... Ugh. Funny thing is, I, I got pushed back from the Stu Peters and Pat King crowd when I said you guys have misunderstood what's going on here, and it's not what it is. And people were saying, "Viva, you're you're, you're pop, you're, you're you're popping the bubble, you're spoiling people's inspiration." And I said, "Look, I, people need reality, not inspiration." I didn't see what's in the water, but I heard RFK say, "Drop the snake venom discussion." Um, yeah. I, and I think at this point now, people are. It's it's a, the, the, the the biggest issue is credibility is is easy to lose and tough to regain. So people are going to. Uh, view the work of certain people, certain ways going forward. Um, I'm just, you know, I, I didn't jump on the bandwagon. I actually gave a, a, a relatively prescient warning. Like you got to vet the content in this movie, uh, but yeah. technically speaking, well done, but it's, it's substance that matters here. And then a few days later, like, yeah, that was Keonti Johnson collapsing on December 12, 2020 before the vaccines. What else is bunk in this movie? Bottom line, I didn't need that documentary uh, to to take out of context things to prove a point that can be proven through legitimate means. Um, Absolutely. And, that- and you know what's interesting about the, the died suddenly phenomena that I believe is going to happen, and I, I suspect that you probably know this is true as well, is that it may be sorted by the insurance companies and the lawyers at the end who don't want to who don't want to insure vaccinated mm-hmm. people, right? The actuarial guys are looking at these numbers and saying, what the hell that, is that's, going on? That's here? what I've been saying from the beginning. It's like, you know what numbers you can trust? The ones that answer to the almighty dollar, where it becomes a question of, of, <laughs> yes. of, of eco- economics. The, un- the underwriters are going to get the information right. So when the insurance yeah. companies tell you something, it's a lot more credible than when the government uh, or, or a, a Stu Peters type tells you something, it, it'll come out in the wash. The other interesting point, which I have not yet looked into, uh, and I'd like yeah. to have the discussion, is some of the critique about the movie was the suspicious clots. Some people are saying those are all post-mortem clots. You know, they're, they're yeah. somewhat normal yep. because the person's dead, the blood clots. Um, yeah. Does that, do, did I need any of that to know that there's a rash of unexplained cardiac issues in young people where I have The Guardian writing articles, new articles, that there's something called SADS and doctors are urging young people to check their hearts. That's the evidence I needed and not, not artificial evidence that once debunked allows everyone who referenced it to be discredited. So, Absolutely. And I, you know, is it wrong for me to say that, and maybe this is naive based, based on what we've seen with COVID and medicine, but if, if, if those clots were appearing as frequently as is alleged in the film, wouldn't more embalmers be speaking out? Like, I know we can say, well, doctors aren't speaking out about COVID vaccine adverse effects, and maybe that's true. But I find it hard to believe that embalmers who, you know, they don't really have any skin in the political game, right? Wouldn't say, wow, this is weird that we're finding so many of these now. You well, know? That, that was I need to do some... Sorry. Well, actually, that, that was one of my reflexes as well. I mean, I even said that in my analysis is like, you know, there's, there's 8 billion people. I don't know how many hundreds of millions of embalmers there are worldwide. Um, but you know, some people say, well, people are being cremated. Autopsies aren't being done, but embalming is different than autopsies. Um, well, and you know what, if people die suddenly, look at died suddenly, I remember this from when I was a police reporter, right? Died suddenly either means that you had a heart attack, you committed suicide, or there was some other thing that they don't really want to talk about. Right. And in, and in a bunch of those scenarios, especially with the heart issues, they do want autopsies. They do want to see what the cause of it was. So it doesn't make sense that people would die suddenly, especially young people. And the family would say, oh, let's have a, we're going to just do a, a cremation. We're not going to, I mean, it makes no, they'd be saying, what happened? What killed my kid? I want to know. Right. Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, that was I interviewed Dan Hartman uh, last night, whose whose 17 year old son died yes. suddenly 30 yeah. days after a vaccine, yeah. but was hospitalized four days after getting the first shot. Uh, he did an autopsy, he came back inconclusive and he's he yeah. wants answers and, and rightfully yeah. so. But yeah, that's my re- that's my my re- my reflex as well. Uh, but w- we do know that a lot of people are th- there's excess mortality that needs explanation. 
everybody wants to run and say, well, it's not the jabs. It's just two years of stress and lockdowns and isolation and unhealthy living. It's like, all right, if that's your explanation, damned one way, damned the other, because both result from incompetent yeah. government overreach. Yeah, and I'm I'm absolutely committed to it being either one or a combination mm -hmm. of both. Um, I, so I just want to say in closing, Viva, that there there was some reporting this morning that China is actually backing off some of its COVID measures based on the demonstration. So Xi is more democratic and responsive to his citizenry than our prime minister is. Justin Trudeau, is, is, he should be very unhappy, Justin Trudeau. They use protests to affect change to public policy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, 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 and, and we can end, well, we can end on this one. I am getting fed up with the idea that we, the people, are expected to be grateful once the abuse stops. That's not oh. enough. And I and and I, I'm I'm a very tolerant and a very loving person. Uh, there need to be consequences for the abuse that we have endured and the unconstitutional yeah. abuse that has been imposed on us. I'm not going to be grateful if they just say you could go back to walking around now at night. Uh, I want I want accountability and. Um, I want something to be done to ensure that this never happens again. Emergencies are not the uh, are, are not the carte blanche to violate basic human rights and dehumanize uh, dehumanize humans. I'm with you, brother. Thank you very much for coming on, and I'm I'm sort of sad that you're in Florida because it means you're not here. But um, you know, DeSantis is sort of my dream leader at the moment it's so. it's for, for all the for all the crap that people uh throw against desantis he handled environmental crises well he's uh he's a true leader but he's also a true leader that respects fundamental rights and he doesn't waffle and he doesn't he doesn't have to contradict himself because when you're guided by principles uh you're you're not going to say a and not a on different days because you simply cannot hold those two views at the same time well, exactly. And you know what the difference between him and half of the fools who were governing during COVID, he actually sat down with knowledgeable epidemiologists and 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 scientists and doctors to try to figure out what the actual story was. He mm. knew what he was talking about. So the, the media could never really lay a glove on him. And sadly, Trump didn't do that. He was kind of going along with the Neil Ferguson numbers for way too long. Trudeau actually doesn't really know much about any of it. He just he just attacks people. And even do you know that Tony Fauci said in the deposition a couple of days ago, he couldn't name a single study that proved that max masks actually work. Did, did you hear about no, that? No, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I, I have to go catch oh. up on that. But hey, it's, oh. hey, but people have only been saying it. It's, it's only been on the boxes that it does not prevent against the transmission of coronaviruses. It's only been on the box mm -hmm. forever. But, you know, who, who can read these yeah. days? So anyway, I was trying to say goodbye and I got off on another tangent <laughs> with you. But <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. Good luck down there. Thank and, you very and, much. Um, you know, stay in touch and let me know how you're how you're doing at Rumble and in and in Florida and how your life is working out. You've been a really, really important part of of this mosaic for me, and I'm I'm quite grateful to you. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Viva. Bye. All right, have a good day. So that was the great Viva Fry. And um He's definitely somebody worth listening to and watching and following on Twitter if you are so inclined to do that. But I want to keep in, I, I want to stay in the theme of legacy media because I did come across something that lifted my spirits a little bit. <laughs> um, and that was a an interview that Martha McCallum did with one of the spokespeople for the American State Department. So the clip is really interesting because it's very, very unusual to hear an American anchor at any of the um, at any of the networks actually do a journalist job, which is asking hard questions and being prepared to do so, like doing the preparation it takes to do it well. So this little clip of Martha McCallum kicking the butt of John Kirby, who was a government, a Biden government spokesman, I believe, with the State Department, who refuses to condemn Apple, which is collaborating against the citizens of China with the CCP, versus Elon Musk, who is trying to obviously encourage more free speech on the platform. And watch what happens here. This is, she's kicking it old school, right? This is like original gangster kind of reporting and interviewing. I love this stuff. It's what I used to do. I did it well because I was always prepared. I would stay up the night before going through documents and 
worrying if the person tries to weasel out this way, what have we got and what evidence have we got and what if they lie? That's what journalists used to do, especially investigative journalists like me. And, uh, and I have to say that watching Martha McCallum do this on Fox News was very, very uplifting. She, she lets him off the hook when he reverts to the old canard of Russia, 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 saying Russia interfered. I believe in the 2016 election, the Russian interference amounted to $45,000 worth of Facebook ads. So she missed that, but that's okay because the rest of what she does here is exactly what you should be expecting from the CBC and CTV and Global and the BBC when spokespeople for the government come on and try to defend an an inconsistent position, which is the the U.S. government's position is inconsistent. They're allowing Apple to collaborate with China against its citizens, and they want to go after Elon Musk at Twitter for organizing a heftier dose of free speech. So listen to this. It's really good. Joining me now on that and some other topics today is the NSC coordinator for strategic communications, John Kirby. John, welcome. Always good to have you with us. Thank you very much for being here. My pleasure. You you know, this is an interesting uh, situation that has developed with with Apple. And and I want to start there and get your take on what Apple is doing, because they have restricted, uh, which is what the Chinese government wants, some use of airdrop ability from iPhone to iPhone because they're cutting the service down. And this is the way the protesters are communicating with each other. What does the White House, what do you say to Apple about helping the Chinese government to keep their people under control? Well, look, in general, and we've uh, been clear about this all around the world, we uh, uh, we want the individual citizens, uh, no matter what government they live under, to be able to communicate freely and openly, transparently and reliably. Uh, and we've uh, we've made that clear with respect to Iran, and we certainly continue to make that clear here with respect but to China. But have you made that clear now, to Apple? Apple, <laughs> Apple? Apple's a private company, Martha. They have to make uh, decisions, and uh, they have to speak for those decisions. But but here at the White House, here in the administration, we want to see that, that individual citizens, whether they're protesting or not, Uh, but in this case, I know that's the context we're talking about, are are able to communicate freely and openly. But why not say something to Apple? Because we were just told the other day that the White House is keeping an eye on Elon Musk and Twitter. So why would you say that from the podium? You didn't say it, but Karine Jean-Pierre said it, and not call Apple out for helping the Chinese government to suppress their own people's ability to communicate. Again, I think we've been very clear and consistent on this. Uh, certainly publicly, we've been very open about uh, our desires to be able to see citizens communicate. Uh, and, and, you know, Apple, uh, if this is a decision that they're making, then uh, they should have to speak to that. But uh, we, you know, we're not, we can't and we aren't in the business of, of telling private companies how to, to execute uh, their, their initiatives. Yeah, but Twitter's uh, but a private we, company, too. So why is Twitter getting one treatment and Apple's getting another is my question. Well, these are completely two different circumstances. You're talking about the potential. Well, you're talking about the uh, the potential for perhaps uh, foreign investment and involvement uh, in the management of Twitter. That's a different issue than what we're talking about here, which is a business decision by Apple with respect to how one of their uh, applications is being well, utilized. Well, certainly Those they're getting influenced by, the, by a foreign government, but, uh, and that government is China. And Apple's no, policies, look, they've changed policies specifically for China when it comes to what they put on their phones. Right. I mean, and that I think, seems like something Apple, that the White House ought to be able to keep an eye on. I th- certainly think that's a fair question to ask Apple and, 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 and try to un- and make them uh, communicate why they did this. But I'm asking, uh, has we, the White House done that? I, have you reached out to them as a matter of national security, since we obviously have national yeah. security concerns with China, who they seem to be aiding sure in do. this process? Sure. I don't have any communications to speak to specifically with Apple executives. Again, it's a private company. Uh, they make these policies, and they should have to answer for that. What we want to see is that citizens are, are reliably able to communicate, whether it's a time of crisis or not. Yeah, but you, I, I, I go back to the same thing, because we were just told that the White House will keep an eye on Twitter because they're concerned about the new Twitter 2.0 that Elon Musk is putting in where he wants more free speech on Twitter. So they're going to keep an eye on Twitter, and yet you're taking a hands-off approach. You say there's been no communication with Tim Cook at Apple about this process in China with the Chinese government? 
Martha, I'm not aware that there's been any conversations uh, specifically with Apple on this particular issue. It's a private company. And as for Twitter, again, Martha, these are apples and oranges. We're talking about potential foreign investment issues, and I have nothing to report in terms of any investigations in that regard. But that was the general concern with respect to, to Mr. Musk's uh, purchase of Twitter. Uh, this is a different issue. This is a policy issue inside of Apple. Uh, they, they both involve foreign governments, I would argue. Um, so, you know, we'll, we can circle back around on that. I want to ask you one more question here. And we're going to get to this a little bit later as well. Elon Musk has just come out and said, uh, and, and by the way, I just want to point out that Elon Musk helped protesters in Iran and in Ukraine by getting Starlink up and working. So he did the absolute opposite of what Tim Cook at Apple is doing right now. But, but I want to get your uh, attention to this. He says, uh, the obvious reality, as longtime users know, is that Twitter has failed in trust and safety for a very long time and has interfered in elections. Twitter 2.0 will be far more effective, transparent, and even-handed. He's been talking about opening up the communications that existed between entities, perhaps even the U.S. government, perhaps even the White House, and Twitter about suppressing the Hunter Biden story. Are you concerned at all? Are you aware of any communications between uh, the government and Twitter to say, put a, put a handle on this story, and it was suppressed? We know that Facebook said that there was interaction between some government yeah. officials and them about being very cautious about this Hunter Biden story right before the election. Uh, I'm certainly not aware of any conversations or dialogue in, in that respect, Martha, no. So, you know, what do you say about the fact that he says that there was interference in the election? Because I know that the president has been very passionate about threats to democracy and right. freedom in our elections. So if, if he's saying there's a concern that Twitter has interfered in elections, I would assume that would be a concern of, of yours and the White House's as well. Well, certainly we want to make sure that our elections are free and fair and open and transparent. And any threat to that obviously is a concern of ours. I'm not aware of exactly what Mr. Musk is speaking about here. I look forward to getting more information about that so we can better understand uh, what he's alleging here. Uh, but obviously we want our elections to be free and fair and open. And we know that social media in general uh, was capitalized on from the Russians in particular in 2016. And they tried it uh, in 2018 and they attempted to do it again. In, uh, in 2020, and they claimed that they were working uh, to try to interfere with our election th that we just had, the midterm. So, so we're always watchful for foreign interference, and certainly social media is a venue through which bad actors right. can try to do that. But I'm just not familiar enough with what Mr. Okay. Musk is talking about here. All right, no, no doubt. But you're, you're not suggesting that the Hunter Biden story was Russian disinformation, to be clear. Uh I, I, I am, I'm not suggesting anything uh, with respect to that specific investigation. Okay, we'll see where it all goes. I, I know you're short on time, and I have to let you go. Um, I hope you'll come back soon, John, because we do have more questions, and we appreciate you spending time with us today. You bet, Martha, anytime. Thank you, John. Bravo, brava. That is how it's done, folks. And Martha McCallum, who I find occasionally quite frustrating, uh, she, you know, this is what happens when a reporter actually sits down with the research team and does her homework. They anticipated how he was going to try to weasel out and spin it. And they blocked that with simple facts, just the facts, right? He got away with a little bit too much on uh, the Russian interference during, you know, $45,000 in Facebook ads. And then she, she, you know, he, they never, when they do the Russia thing, they never give specifics because there aren't any that are actually meaningful. So she could have got him there. But listen, this is an A plus. I, I love that she did this. And um, let me just say something to you guys that I'm not aware is spokesman speak for, I'm not going to tell you, right? He didn't actually deny, he didn't say no. He didn't say no when they were talking about the Hunter Biden laptop story being suppressed. He said, I am not aware, right? Which answers the question, but let's, lets him off the hook when he gets busted later for lying. So there you go. That's how it should be. That actually happened. And so, you know, we're going to say that Martha McCallum can be the original kind of journalistic gangster today. As the kids say, it's a, it's a great thing to hear. And all it takes is preparation and courage. And she showed both. So props to her. And I will say to you guys, stay critical and we'll see you.